Welcome to the Muzi Cuentos Black Box Podcast, sponsored by MuziCuentos.com and Indwelling Language. Today's episode is a little bit different. You can call it Throwback Thursday here at the Muzi Cuentos Black Box Podcast because the team has been looking at classic articles from second language acquisition research that still impact research and practice today. We'll step back in time as far back as the 1960s and 70s to look at things that have brought us to where we are today. Each of your Black Box presenters will hit highlights from names and ideas that won't ever be forgotten. Without further ado, let's go. We'll start with mine, and I'm Albert Fernandez. The article that I've chosen for our Throwback Thursday episode is called Communicative Competence, Theory and Classroom Practice, which is a paper presented at the Central States Conference on the Teaching of Foreign Languages in 1976 by Sandra Savignon. The main idea of the paper is to advocate for teaching for communicative competence over linguistic competence. Instead of focus on form, we focus on communication, and that might look different in our different classrooms. Back in 1976, Savignon stated, quote, it is not a question of from linguistic competence to communicative competence, but rather of from communicative competence to linguistic competence. It is not a question of patching up existing programs with communicative practice drills or pseudo-communication, but of redefining our goals and rethinking our methods, unquote. It blows me away that this statement was written 40 years ago, because this is the same debate that we are having within our profession right now. In the article, Savignon takes on major topics that are being discussed in methods classrooms and on social media at this very moment. Things like overemphasis on linguistic accuracy from the very beginning, need for tests which measure not knowledge about language but ability to use language effectively, allowing or encouraging students to use language for their own purposes, a syllabus based on how-tos which are sort of like can-do statements, tolerance for and encouragement of risk-taking in the language, and errors as exploration. She goes on to talk about problems that teachers experience in the classroom that are based on methods that are tied to linguistic competence over communicative competence specifically that language teachers tend to be seen as, quote, language defender, defender of form, defender of tradition against perceived assaults of diversification and change, unquote. Inexperienced non-native language teachers sometimes may be too intimidated to use their own knowledge that they learn in their methods courses to teach communicatively and thus end up avoiding using the methods that could get a new generation of students to communicative competence. Savignon advises, quote, try and relax about your own errors. Chances are you make them. Don't let that keep you from speaking spontaneously with your students. You will be allowing them the practice that they need to improve. Don't be afraid to admit it when you don't know a word or a pronunciation. Your frank admission of what you don't know will make you that much more credible in the eyes of your students. It will ultimately serve to give your students confidence that they too can learn to use the language, unquote. The reason I chose this article for our throwback episode is that the methods and philosophies of teaching that are coming into vogue right now are nothing new. These ideas have been around for a while. It is important for us to know our history so that these ideas are not forgotten and not lost to the dusty back shelves of academic libraries and the unexplored servers of Eric and JSTOR. There's no need for us to reinvent the wheel every time we want to try something that focuses our students towards being able to create with their L2. S. Pitt Quarter's article, The Significance of Learners' Errors, which appeared in the International Review of Applied Linguistics in 1967, was foundational to multiple strands of research in second language acquisition. In it, Quarter notes how little attention works on language teaching have paid to learners' errors. He sees two main schools of thought on errors in his day. The first holds that errors are a sign of bad teaching and wouldn't happen in the first place with better teaching. The second school of thought is that errors are inevitable, and we should focus simply on how to deal with them after they occur. Corder proposes a third option. Corder makes a distinction that many still uphold today between errors and mistakes. Mistakes are errors of performance that native speakers make as well, such as slips of the tongue, and may stem from fatigue, memory lapses, or strong emotion. Mistakes are unsystematic and don't really provide useful information about the learner's progress. Errors, on the other hand, are systematic differences from how a native speaker would say something. Corder emphasizes that these patterns are evidence that the learner is working with a real linguistic system that simply hasn't become the same as a native speaker's, an idea Larry Selinker made famous a few years later in his article on interlanguage. 
Corder proposes that, rather than regard errors either as signs of bad teaching or as a nuisance, teachers and researchers pay attention to systematic errors in order to get an idea of what Corder calls the learner's built-in syllabus, that is, a natural progression in the direction of a native-like linguistic system. The idea of this built-in syllabus gave rise to a massive wave of research, still ongoing, into the sequence and stages in which learners acquire different features of a language. Corder himself doesn't describe what a built-in syllabus might look like, but he does call for a shift from a teacher-designed syllabus, which, he says, is generally, quote, based at best on impressionistic judgments and vaguely conceived theoretical principles, end quote, to a syllabus that takes seriously what learners have actually acquired and what they are up for acquiring next. Corder closes by paraphrasing von Humboldt's famous declaration that one cannot really teach language, only create conditions for it to develop in the learner's mind. Corder asserts, quote, We shall never improve our ability to create such favorable conditions until we learn more about the way a learner learns and what his built-in syllabus is. When we do know this, and the learner's errors will, if systematically studied, tell us something about this, we may begin to be more critical of our cherished notions. We may be able to allow the learner's innate strategies to dictate our practice and determine our syllabus. We may learn to adapt ourselves to his needs rather than impose on him our preconceptions of how he ought to learn, what he ought to learn, and when he ought to learn it." End quote. This sounds like a goal worth pursuing. Larry Selinker's article titled Interlanguage appeared in the 1972 edition of the International Review of Applied Linguistics and changed the face of second language acquisition research. To fully understand what the interlanguage article is about and what it meant, we need to understand that Selinker came at the issues from a psycholinguistic perspective, addressing the psychology of an adult learner. And he carefully distinguished between the teacher perspective and the learner perspective. His concern was the learner. So does that mean we as teachers don't have anything to glean from it? Definitely not. To start talking about what goes on in the learner's head, Selinker notes that a very small percentage of people learn a second language and sound like natives in ways they could not have been taught. Selinker first wonders, what do these perhaps 5% of people have that enabled them to become that way? Good question. Here's a better one. What about the other 95%? The fact is that regardless of factors like input and instruction, they continue to say stuff that is not what a native speaker would say to communicate the same meaning. This phenomenon is known as fossilization. Thus, according to Selinker, we are compelled to hypothesize that there is a separate linguistic system called interlanguage. Selinker went on to propose some factors that affect how learners create those interlanguage systems, such as language transfer and some problems with this perspective, but let's get to some application. Why talk about this psychological system called interlanguage, and what does it have to do with classroom learning? For one thing, experience as language learners and with language learners has taught us that we cannot expect the vast majority of learners to reach a point of mastery where they sound like natives. A key realization behind moving from talking about fluent speakers to begin talking about proficient speakers. Selinker gave us a name for these non-native systems, interlanguage. Even more pertinent to Selinger's purpose, he wanted to push us farther in the discussion on how a learner does not develop language ability principally by copying what she hears, or by learning sets of rules. Rather, a learner creates and recreates language in the head based on what she's exposed to. This is the key point of this influential article. Inside your head, a language learner, is something that is not the native language and not the target language. It is also not a random mess of errors. It's an actual system of language that you have created in your brain, and it follows rules. The article was a splash felt for decades. A search of scholarly journals reveals 1,500 articles referencing the concept of interlanguage, the vast majority coming after this 1972 call from Selinker. The body of research helps us explore how interlanguage is a system, like any other language. It has rules and influences, and it makes us keep thinking about where the learner will tend to end up, not where we would like him to end up. And interlanguage is the systematic end of the journey for most language learners. So it's worth a look, eh? It makes sense to think that once you learn something new and practice it, that you'll get better at it over time. Learning a language, that might look like acquiring a new form and then producing it with increasing accuracy and consistency. If we were to draw a line graph of the number of times you said something correctly in the target language, we might think that it would be a straight line going from the bottom left of a graph 
up to the top right. In 1983, Patsy Lightbound studied French middle schoolers in English class. In the first stages of practicing ING and the present progressive, students accurately said things like, he is taking a cake, showing that they had initially acquired the correct form in use. Over time, students started saying, he take a cake. But eventually, they returned to producing forms like, he is taking a cake. If we were to draw a line graph of these students' performance, it would not show linear improvement. Instead, it would start high, drop low, and then come back up, looking like a U. U-shaped learning is a concept that shows three stages of linguistic performance. In the beginning, students produce some linguistic form that appears to be error-free, but over time, it appears that the learner actually loses that knowledge. And then, apparently miraculously, the learner regains the ability to use the target form consistently. There are a few theories on what is actually happening behind U-shaped learning. One way of thinking about it, as described by Gasson Selinker in their textbook, Second Language Acquisition, is that a learner is repeating a stock phrase or string of syllables without unpacking the syntactic or semantic rules of each element on a deep level. As the new concept gets unpacked, the learner's language knowledge undergoes a process of restructuring and some of the new information has to find its place within the existing language structures in the learner's mind. Once the process of restructuring is sorted out, the learner can show that they have acquired the new knowledge by producing the correct language again. Another way of thinking about this, as discussed by Siegler, Gershkoff, Stowe, and Thelen in the Journal of Cognition and Development, focuses on the difference between knowledge and the ability to retrieve that knowledge. Looking at vocabulary size, as a child learns more words, they may struggle to actually use those words correctly because there are so many new terms in the child's head that compete to be used in natural speech. Retrieval ability grows more slowly than vocabulary size. So what do the ideas of U-shaped learning and restructuring mean for classroom language acquisition? It means that making mistakes can be a sign of healthy cognitive processes. If a teacher is bummed when it appears that students are getting things wrong, things that they used to get right, that's okay. It's just their brain restructuring its knowledge of the target language and increasing its ability to retrieve the right word or morpheme at the right time. Wilkins argues that, quote, while without grammar very little can be conveyed, without vocabulary nothing can be conveyed, end quote. However, there are many steps that go into knowing a word, including form, meaning, and use. How is a word pronounced? In what context is it used? What other words occur with this one? Second language acquisition theorist Tracy Terrell advocated for binding when learning languages, a term used to describe the brain's process of linking meaning to forms. This occurs when learners connect a new word with its meaning, not a translation. Binding is something that is influential in our learning of our L1. The Terrell article is quite long, so to keep it short, we're just going to highlight some of the main points. The first is that he redefines acquisition and learning from Krashen's original definition to a binding and access framework. His desire was not to change Krashen's theory, but to situate it to the classroom teacher in how to design learning exercises to help the acquisition process for students. In his article, Terrell shared the acquisition process for two class activities, listening comprehension and speech production and the components of these skills, such as binding, access, and strategies. Terrell noted characteristics of the natural approach that facilitate the binding process, acquisition in stages, concrete association, and speech techniques. For the first, Terrell presented three important stages for language acquisition of novice learners, comprehension, early speech, and speech emergence. Acquisition for Terrell meant that a form, which could be a word or a verb structure, could be understood and produced. For beginning or novice learners, nothing is more important for communication than building a vocabulary base and binding to uninflected nouns, verbs, and adjectives is relatively simple. Terrell continues with a discussion on binding with simple and complex grammatical structure and how the natural approach helps students acquire these in a natural order. For more information, please read the complete article Acquisition in the Natural Approach, the Binding Access Framework. 
The Muzi Cuentos Black Box Podcast is a collection of media resources intended to form an easy-to-access, easy-to-understand bridge between quality second language acquisition research and teacher practice in a world language classroom. For more information about the Muzi Cuentos Black Box Podcast collection of resources, including ways you can keep this resource available to teachers everywhere, visit muzicuentos.com slash blackbox.